2016 Cavalier Award in Nanoscience is for the invention and realization of atomic force microscopy. And I'm happy to introduce the first speaker, who's Gerd Binning. He's a German physicist, and he studied at Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt and obtained his PhD in 1978. He then became a research staff member at IBM Zürich, and in collaboration with Heinrich Rohr and other colleagues, including Christoph Gerber and Edmund Weibel, he developed the scanning tunneling microscope in 1981. In recognition of this work, Benig and Rohr received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1986. Between 1985 and 1988, Benning was based in California, working at IBM in Almaden and at Stanford University. It was during this period that he involved his IBM colleague Christoph Gerber and Stanford professor Kelvin Quaid in realizing his idea of the atomic force microscope. In 1994, he founded the Finians. The company develops advanced processing tools for maximizing the collection of information for images with a particular use for applications in medical diagnostics. Please. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's really a, a great honor and a pleasure to be here. And I'm actually really glad to see, after you learned that I'm German from him, that you are still uh, willing to listen to me after the soccer game last night. <laughs> so I, I will talk about, oh, oh sorry, I was too fast, um, about the theme attracted by atoms. Scientists are actually attracted by atoms. They love to see atoms and play with atoms, but also atoms are attracted by atoms, and that's one of the basic elements of atomic force microscopy. And um, when we look into nature, even if you look to the Earth from outside, it's actually formed by nanotechnology, by the nanotechnology of nature. Everything, at least life, is built from these tiny little elements like proteins and genes, built up from bottom up, from atoms, molecules, to the bigger structures. So this is actually nature's nanotechnology. And we are trying to do something similar. We are still far behind, but we are catching up, I would say. Uh, to construct the atomic force microscope quite a few years ago, um, happened uh, in California. and. I had really the privilege to be in the group of Calvin Quaid, which is, I think, a, was a marvelous group at that time. And uh, uh, that was a fantastic group in terms of teamwork and also in this spirit, uh, creative spirit, spirit Calvin created was really something I've never seen before or after at a university. So that was fantastic. And some of his students, from that time are still here, actually in, in, in the audience. And also, it was certainly a great pleasure also to work with Christoph Gerber. I worked with him already on the scanning tunneling microscope. We had already at that time a lot of fun and, and doing the atomic force microscope was certainly a pleasure again. And if we could not uh, continue our work because it was too nice, too, uh, too noisy because of some, uh, 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 during the day we, people walked around, so we had sometimes to work at night. Then uh, during the day we went on the golf course, which was also <laughs> not so bad. <laughs> so there, be, besides the atomic force microscope, there are a few other microscopes uh, around uh, on Earth, and uh, the first one was the optical microscope. And I think that must have been an amazing or fantastic impression when you see for the very first time that something like a living cell exists and you can watch it. That's a few centuries ago. And, and then the electron microscope actually can then look into the details of those cells, into the cell compartments, and, uh, and also seeing in some situations also atoms or atomic structures at least of crystals. Then there was an 
roughly at the same time of the invention of the uh, electron microscope was this stylus profilometer, which is a, a purely uh, mechanical instrument. You have just a needle and you scratch over the surface and feel the roughness of the surface. In the beginning it just was a, a test for roughness and also then the chip industry used it to measure step heights when you, they evaporated some gold films or so. And the resolution is, interestingly uh, enough, uh, is a little bit better than the optical microscope, something like 100 nanometers at that time when we uh, discovered the atomic force microscope. And then, uh, and, it, and it has certainly a similarity to, atomi to the atomic force microscope. That's also one reason why I mentioned it. And then there was immunohistochemistry. It's not a microscope, but it's also a very interesting trick to make things uh, visible by attaching to something that's in principle not visible with something uh, that that is bigger or has a much higher contrast. And that's what people did in biology to make, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, genes or uh, proteins visible by attaching something bigger to it. A nice trick, but not a microscope. And then there was a field ion microscope where you could see atoms for the first time. The, it has only one disadvantage, it could only look at itself. So the, it, it, that was a little bit of a, a fallback, but uh, it, it still was exciting to see for the first time atomic structures um, by, by high fields. And uh, the tip itself is more or less the microscope, and you can only look at the tip. And then uh, we invented the scanning tunneling microscope. Uh, in 82, we had a, had a breakthrough, and then you could actually look at atomic structures on surfaces for the, for the very first time. Uh, and then the, the SNOM was breaking uh, the diffraction limit for the first time by having the laser trapped in a little hole uh, and guided in the, in, in the near field. We heard the term near field already today. And, uh, and then the atomic force microscope, that's the reason why we are here. Yeah, today, the three of us. And, and then there was a STET microscope where you can look in a three-dimensional way actually into the, into the cells to, and, and look at uh, nano-objects. And some of those uh, instruments actually got the Nobel Prize and others got the Kavli Prize. So it's a good mixture, I, I would say. So the first instrument I was working with was a scanning tunneling microscope and the basic idea here is to get in touch with atoms. Yeah, not with your fingertip but you get in touch with an extremely fine uh, needle and bring it extremely close to the surface till the electron clouds touch and the current can flow from one side to the other. And if you scan over the contours of the surface by keeping this distance constant um, and do that line by line, you create an image. And this way, uh, actually, you can observe the atoms. So in 1982, we first could observe the atoms in a clear-cut way on this silicon surface, where every bump here is a, is a silicon atom sitting on the surface. And that's what we did at that time, and that's what people can do today. It's, a, it's really <laughs> a little bit nicer, I, would, I, I should admit. But what we already saw at that time between the rows of atoms, you can see there, there is a valley. So it's on the silicon surface. So it's a silicon valley, in principle. <laughs> and, and at that time, everyone talked about Silicon Valley, but nobody has seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> and and we, one didn't even know whether it exists at all. But now we know it's real. It had one little problem, uh, the scanning tunneling microscope. You need a conductor, because you have this current flowing from the tip to the surface. And I was always wondering, hmm, could one not get rid of this current, which is somehow a, a limitation, because you cannot look at insulators and biological materials is also not so good. And sometimes you want to measure even underwater uh, uh, biology at action. And you couldn't do that with the current. Uh, that, that, that's too complicated. So how could you get such great atomic resolution like with the SDM by other means? And I, I would say for two years I was thinking about it and 
always coming up with ideas, and when you look in the details, it wouldn't work. So I, after a while, I gave up and thought um, <laughs> it might not work, but there was this <clears throat> uh, information in the background that people would say, actually, when you do measure and come that close with the tip to the surface, you m must send some forces because the distance is so small. And measuring forces at that time was not, not an option. And, and we had also, and, and John Petticar was, was one person who worked as a stylus profilometer. And he pointed that out first. You have to take care of the forces. And we made an interesting measurement um, at that time also uh, with the SDM, looking at naked DNA for the very first time. So at that time, in electron microscopy, people covered it with a gold film, and they could see in an indirect way uh, the, DNA, uh, the DNA strands. We thought we could see it directly. And we did this measurement, put DNA strands on the surface, and actually, there they were. So we saw the DNA strands. And, but then we had a, a, a second look, and we figured out, oh, we are holding the figure the wrong way. We had to put it upside down. So it actually was not something lying on the surface. We saw grooves. Why is that? Why do we see grooves? And we put something on top of the surface. And the explanation is relatively simple. It's a force effect because the DNA blocked the current. You, we couldn't get a current. And then the tip had to move forward and forward, def deform everything until it gets into a region where you can draw some current out of it. So it, it's a pure deformation effect, and it's a force effect. And with all this in the back of our minds, uh, we did still not come up with an idea uh, to build such a new microscope. So not consciously uh, coming to this idea, my subconscious mind helped me a little. So I, I was lying on the couch and stared at the ceiling, and there was some rough structures on the ceiling. and. Uh, that's like looking into the clouds. When you look in clouds, you see all kinds of figures, uh, like rabbits or whatever. You know? uh, and there, looking at the ceiling, I saw a, a hint. There was actually a tip, but it, the tip was mounted on a cantilever on a little spring. So it, if it's mounted on a spring, it means you can sense the deflection of the spring. And it means you can sense the force. And yeah, maybe force. That's a way to, to do it. And then I discussed with my colleagues, Calvin Quaid and Christoph Gerber, is that a way to build a new type of microscope with atomic resolution? And we came to the conclusion, yes, it probably is. If you want to do this, you need to measure the force between two single atoms. If you really want to get atomic resolution, you have to feel a single atom. Can you actually measure the force between two single atoms? I think nobody has asked this question at that time. But we asked this question, and we came to the conclusion, yes, we can. The force between two single atoms is actually not that small. You can measure it. Yeah. The principle is like this. You have the tip mounted on a, on a cantilever that gets deflected, and you move over the atoms on the surface, and you have a, a sensor that measures the deflection of this cantilever. And, and that was in our paper uh, showing the principle also. And there are many, many different uh, methods around where you sense the deflection of the cantilever very precisely, much less than uh, an atomic uh, diameter. Uh, a, f a small, small fraction of that can be measured. And, and uh, we measured it actually with a scanning tunneling microscope. So having a tunneling tip to the, to the cantilever, you can measure something like 10 to the, four, to, uh, to, uh, 10 to the minus 4 angstrom's deflection, so much less than atomic di diameter. So that was the first approach, but in the meantime, many other methods are, are around. To give you a little bit of a feeling for the dimensions we have, here you see a hair, uh, and, and the cantilever we figured out should be extremely small. So if you want to make a spring extremely soft, um, 
you make it softer and softer, but it gets uh, more non noisy this way. But if you make this, uh, the spring softer and softer and make it at the same time smaller and smaller, uh, the resonance frequency uh, gets higher and higher. Uh, and this way, it doesn't get, it's, it's not anymore so sensitive to building vibrations. Uh, we heard about building vibrations also this morning. Um, and, and making it really small and still soft this is the way to go. And, and that's what you see here on the left hand side. Uh, that's a cantilever compared to the size of a hair is pretty small and you can make quite a few advantages out of that. And if you now zoom into the cantilever by a factor of 10, then you can see the tip nicely. If you zoom in into the end of the tip by a factor of 10, you see nothing but a tip. And zoom in by another factor of 10 again, also just the tip, and another factor of 10. And then you start seeing the atoms. So the well, atom is a pretty small object. And we built the first uh, force microscope, atomic force microscope, and we just, uh, we had no means to build these uh, micro machined cantilevers at that time. So we just took a gold foil and cut a tiny piece out of it. And Christoph and myself went into a shop, into a music shop, and bought a, a, a diamond from a record player and smashed it with a hammer in two pieces. <laughs> and then we took a tiny little piece of that and glued it onto the, to this gold foil. And then we had a cantilever. I mean, could make better cantilevers than that, but it, at least it worked. And we got the first uh, results like this. We called it the atomic force microscope, and we published that, but you don't see any atoms. Yeah. So we were really very daring and <laughs> to giving it uh, that name, but we were confident that's a piece of cake to get then the atomic resolution as well a little later. And, and actually, at the same, same time, um, I just to gain confidence, I did the quick experiment in uh, IBM Almaden in a UHV chamber, ultra vacuum chamber, where they had a scanning tunneling microscope. And I bent the needle of the, uh, of the end of this tip into a spring and excited the spring into oscillations by an oscillating voltage, a tunneling voltage between tip and sample. And then it uh, as, uh, excited it in, into resonance frequency and it started resonating. And then if you scan across the surface, the tip at the end feels the forces and it changes its, uh, resonance, uh, its resonance frequency this way. And here is uh, the phase shift of this resonance plotted. And then I saw actually uh, small, very small structures, very close to atomic resolution. And maybe it was already atomic resolution, but it was not a clear cut surface. And uh, but there were some small structures and, and pretty soon, actually in the same year when we published the atomic force microscope, uh, Calvin Quaid uh, with a student of him, uh, Tom Albrecht, they um, built the first cantilevers, really small micro machine, like it would, uh, the same kind of processes you apply to electronic chips. Uh, and, and immediately after this, we, we could observe atomic structures, the first atomic structures. And a few months later, Tom Albrecht and Calvin Quaid published the result, that the very first result, atomic resolution on an insulator in 87. So that was, I think, a great uh, breakthrough. And three years after we published that, um, Don Eichler and his colleague Schweitzer they shifted atoms around. They didn't do it with atomic force microscope, but they did it with the scanning tunneling microscope. But they used forces. So maybe they were also a little bit inspired by the atomic force microscope to use forces to shift atoms around. And they could build all these nice structures. Today, in the same lab, people actually use atomic force microscope to shift atoms around. And while they are doing that, they measure uh, what kind of forces are required or are involved in you? Yeah, that's my granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't like my talk. <laughs> Apologize. <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, so they, they measure actually what kind of forces are involved and they shift the atoms around and measure the forces uh, that are required to do so. Uh, but before we got there to do such kind of very precise measurements, a few inventions had to be made on, on, on the way. One of them is done by Meyer and Amer, um, making use of this very short lengths of the cantilever. So if you have a cantilever here and you deflect it up and down and you shine with a laser beam on it and your detector is far away uh, from, from this cantilever, you get an angle and if, the, if you are far away it really gets a big displacement of the, of the laser beam. And you can measure this uh, deflection very precisely. And if your lever is much shorter then this deflection is much bigger for the same amount of uh, de depletion uh, for, of the cantilever. And, 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 uh, and you have seen before, those cantilevers are really very short. It's something like a tenth of a millimeter in length. And then this method is actually very sensitive and extremely helpful because with this technique, uh, you can image in water very nicely. Yeah, with the current was again a problem, but with this laser in water, and you can have access this way to biological material very, very nicely. And at the same time, you can uh, measure friction. So uh, when you have your cantilever this way and you scan across a surface like this and you measure the, the topography by the beam getting up and down and you get also a twist of the cantilever through, due to the friction and you measure that simultaneously, you can do tribology, which people do quite a bit now on the atomic scale. And then an important step was actually which happened before this laser beam by doing it by different means. <clears throat> um, they, Paul Hansmeier and his group, they figured out how to measure underwater. And un measuring in water, uh, that's a, a, a great thing. But a scanning tunneling microscope couldn't do that. So then you can look at bi biological material and you can actually image biological material while something is happening. So at work, bi biology at work, on the close to atomic scale. And I, I was uh, with Paul Hansma at, at that time on a conference in Cancun and we went together snorkeling and, and uh, I took a picture of him like this and I bet he got inspired by this imaging underwater. So that's, that's, I guess that's how he, how he invented that. We pretty soon after that started to use this, use the laser beam deflection and measured then biology underwater. We took a, a cell like here, put it on the pipette and measured with a cantilever uh, fine structure. So we infected actually the cell with viruses to see what's happening and we could see all kinds of interesting things going on. At least was the first measurement on a, on a living cell on very high resolution. And, uh, but more impressive actually at that time was the work from Andreas Engel and co-workers where they imaged proteins, proteins at work. So underwater, on the right hand side you see ion channels, some of them are open, some of them are closed, which sit on the cell membrane. And, and these ion channels he could switch by changing the conditions in the water, the pH value, and, and then he could observe the different states of the, of the ion channels, which I found uh, amazing. To, to give you a little bit hint of what, how the, uh, the atomic force microscope works when you approach with your tip to the, to the surface it's shown here. You have a cantilever coming close to the, uh, to the surface of a sample and then you measure the deflection of the cantilever. You come a little closer and the tip gets then a little bit attracted like you can see here. So it gets deflected, deflected towards the sample you come a little closer and you touch, it starts already repelling a little, a little, but still maybe the attractive forces might dominate. And then you push harder, it gets uh, repelled. So that's a, a typical force distance curve um, that you can see here. And we did a very careful measurement at that time. We had a problem. Yeah. So many people published atomic resolution and we did the same thing. 
But we realized all these images were perfectly ordered sometimes. And we knew from scanning, tunneling, microscope, that's not how surfaces look like. You have always some disorder, you have always defects on surfaces or anything. And we didn't observe that uh, to, uh, in, in a clear-cut way. So I got a little worried. Does, does a, a atomic force microscope really achieve atomic resolution? So what, what I then did together with a student, a band, uh, uh, Frank Ohnesorge, um, he we measured the surface of a crystal underwater, calcium carbonate, calcite, um, by approaching very slowly to the surface. And when you are far away, I mean you are not in touch with the surface, you don't see anything. And you come a little closer, and sometimes you see a few spikes, might be noise, might be not noise, and you come a little closer, and then you suddenly see a structure. And if something is dark, it means the tip gets attracted by, by the surface. And then you saw the atoms, the atomic structure you, you expected. And but, and, and we could move the tip around and do these force distance curves, like, like uh, shown here on the right-hand side. And when we moved it over the surface, the force distance curve was uh, changed, just by moving it just slightly in a different position. That told us we really measure the force between two single atoms here in this case. And then we learned if we come even a little closer and pushing a little bit more on the surface, it gets confusing. So then, then the surface and the tip gets deformed and you image with several atoms. And you, some of them attract and some of them repel. Though that's not the way how to get atomic resolution by pressing too hard into to a, a, a surface. That's what we learned by this way. And we, we figured that we can look in one crystal direction and you see the atoms are aligned. And if you look in another crystal direction, you see that they go in a zigzag. That's exactly the, the structure you expect when you look to calcite. Then another step, which is, was very important, is to go into the direction of surface uh, uh, physics and surface chemistry to look at the reaction of a catalyst on an atomic scale, you need to go to ultra-high vacuum. And can you get atomic resolution in ultra-high vacuum? And Franz Giesebrink, I think, is also here. He, for the first time, got atomic resolution on silicon with an atomic force microscope. And, and these are the kind of images uh, you get today but you see even more details and an excellent uh, uh, picture, uh, excellent resolution. Uh, and for this, uh, another invention was uh, required, what by, made by uh, Franz Kiesebel, which he calls a Q-plus sensor. It's actually not a tiny little cantilever that gets deflected. It's soft by other means. I mean, it's a well-defined tuning fork that oscillate with a very well-defined um, uh, frequency, with what we call a high Q. Uh, and if it does this, if it would oscillate with such a high Q, you can measure frequency changes very uh, precisely. If you, if you look here for, uh, on a, uh, to um, a tuning fork we use for music, oscillate at 440 hertz, and now you add another tip, uh, another spring to this tuning fork, it will oscillate with a higher frequency. It will be slightly perturbed. And the same thing happens if you do a tube, to have a tuning fork and a tip mounted onto this tuning fork and you slightly come in contact with the surface and the front end of the tip feels just an atom. And then already you see the frequency is, is changed. So when you now use this tuning fork and move it across the surface, the tuning force plays music, so to speak, because it, the, the interaction between the surface changes well, what kind of atom you have there and what kind of interaction you have at the atomic scale. It's not really music because it, uh, the frequency shifts you have uh, and you can measure are very, very small. And, 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 but at least you can measure them very nicely. Just uh, the interaction between two single atoms is sens uh, sensitive enough the technology. And by, by using that, and by using a very well-defined tip, where you have a CO molecule at the end of the tip, 
you, you measure with the oxygen atom, have a very well-defined situation in front of you, and you can measure all kinds of atom you put put on top of a surface, like here, it's an iron atom, or atom on copper crystal, and you can see whether you have two, three or four um, atoms sitting there, you can clearly distinguish between the different situations. And if you look into the uh, one where you just have one atom, you actually see a threefold rotational symmetry. So by three maxima, you, you see actually details in, that, in the structure of these atoms here in this case. So it uh, was a nice uh, breakthrough as well. And, and you can see also in the center of the atoms, you see attractive forces, meaning that because it's dark. Yeah. And the, the, the CO molecule was invented by Gerhard uh, Meyer and Leo Gross. They found that if you have put some CO molecules on, a, on the surface by letting it to, into the chamber and you pick one up, it really nicely gets attached to the surface and make use of it, and you can image a uh, uh, surface in a very nice way. And they measured, actually, in, 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 uh, with Leo Gross and et al., uh, this small molecule with carbon-carbon bonds, which are very small distance of bonds with only something like 1.4 uh, angstroms. It's a tiny little molecule, but still, you can uh, uh, resolve all the structures like a uh, ball and stick model, like you learn in chemistry, you see it directly, yeah, this way. And, and then you do some kind of chemical process, and you don't know what the chemical process produces, what kind of molecules come out of it, you just have a look and put them on the surface and look what the final result is. And that's actually what they did. Another way of doing AFM is also uh, by just measuring forces without any at uh, atomic resolution, just use it in biology. In biology, forces play a very central role because uh, everything is driven by force, or not everything, but many, many, many very important interactions for, for instance, cell, cell interactions, molecules on the surface of cells bind to each other, and if they bind to each other, something happens. A cascade is triggered and maybe it goes down to the genes and proteins are produced this way. So this interaction is essential. Also, the molecules within the cells, the proteins, they interact by forces with each other. So to bind or not bind is a very basic question in biology. biology. And here now you can do this, that you just measure those forces by um, seeing in the next uh, slide, by uh, functionalizing uh, the, tip, the tip by putting some well-defined molecules at the end of the tip, and then bring it close contact to a tip, uh, to a molecule you want to investigate and bring it in contact. And then now you pull back and the first part of the molecule unfolds. And you see a little kink here uh, in, the, in the force distance curve. By pulling it back, you measure exactly how much force did you need to unfold this molecule. And you pull again, another part of the molecule gets unfolded, and again and again, and everything gets unfolded. You always can see how much force did were required to do this process. And in the end, uh, you just can unfold the, the, the binding you produce in the, in the very beginning. So that's um, something, if you, if you put that into, the, into Google, and this, this term AFM and force spectroscopy, you get many, many different pages of results uh, just in, in this area. And then uh, another very important theme, I'm on minus. Yeah, yeah then I have to speed up. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's doing... Uh, structuring surfaces, moving atoms around uh, and doing all kinds of stuff you can do. In particular, if you functionalize the tip, with, uh, making use of all these possibilities. Um, Christoph will talk a little bit more about this. I just want to give you one interesting example came in, coming also out of this research lab in, in Rischlikon, um, uh, where the uh, Schule et, et al. 
where they put a molecule on top and, it, and imaged it, then they applied a little voltage and break off one atom from this molecule. Then the structure has changed. Another voltage and break off another atom. And the molecule has changed again, but then it's more interesting what's coming now. Now you apply another voltage and the molecule changes its, uh, comp uh, not its composition, that stays the same, but how the bonds are established. So just one bond is broken and you can do that reversibly. So you can break it, bind again, break it, depending on what kind of voltage you applied. So it's a, a chemical flip-flop, so it's a switch you can uh, produce this way just on a single tiny little uh, molecule. I found that, found that very exciting. I skip over that because uh, I'm running out of time. Just making advantage of the small size of the cantilever, you can put 1,000 or more than 1,000 on a 3 by 3 millimeters and you can image in parallel with 1,000 cantilevers at the same time. You can use it for manipulation and all things and we wanted to use it for storage but the evolution of flash memory was too, too good to uh, uh, make this investment of maybe a billion or more uh, valuable enough. So that, that brings me now to the, to the end. Um, uh, it's another way of combining biology with surface modification. So the group of uh, Hermann Gaub, they played with uh, a lot with DNA. So what you can do, you put a DNA at the end of your tip and you prepare a surface with DNA and on the left hand side the, the, the DNA is, um, is uh, attached to something else, yeah? in this case to a fluorescent uh, molecule, but you could put anything on there. And then you come close with your, your tip to the, to the surface and and these DNA, it's a single-stranded DNA, you, you get some hybridization here in this case, and the two DNA strands bind to each other in a well-defined way, because you can program the DNA in a way that you know what kind of forces is, are involved, and you pick it up, because it binds more strongly to the, to the tip DNA than to the rest of the, uh, than, than to the prepared surface. And you move it over, and here they have also DNA strands. And it, it's designed in the way that the binding there is actually stronger than uh, the binding to the, to the tip DNA. And then you deposit it. And, and this way you can repeat this and you put it, all the molecules could, could be actually differently functionalized, but you pick where you want to have something picked up and put it uh, just on, on the surface exactly in the place where you want to be, or it to be. So that's structuring in a very nice, uh, nice way. And they did that just for me, because when they learned I got the Kavli Prize, they, they did exactly this uh, and, and, uh, and, and produced this kind of structures. <laughs> so, I, I, I really loved that. <laughs> so. <laughs> so in the, to uh, have a look into the future, very short, I think it's mainly going in the direction of nanoprocessor is something that is not solved yet. How to reproduce a structure you already built with the AFN, but how to put it uh, on another surface, uh, re reproduce it in a very fast and cheap fashion to, for industrial reproduction. That would be great. And in, in medicine, I think one thing is very important in the future that, uh, that we learn how to deal with interactions or with interaction networks of molecules. I mean, that's, biology is all about interaction networks of molecules. And we address in medicine just one molecule with uh, another molecule that, drug molecules that binds to somewhere. I think we have to interact uh, with the interaction network, bring it, bringing uh, interaction network to the interaction network of nature. Yeah? So the drug in the future is a little bit more compli uh, complex and I think AFM can help here to understand how to, how to do that. And with this I would like to thank you very much for your attention.